I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and in today's video, I'm going to continue the discussion on Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Um, I'm uh, slowly working through Chapter 1, and the primary focus of this section of Chapter 1 is a recognition of the role of um, dialogical thought, the role that the oppressed play in their own uh, emancipation from oppression and the complications that arise. Um, the discussion will end in um, a discussion which I'll continue in the next segment of the series of the inherency of violence uh, to, oppress, uh, to the act of uh, oppression um, and also the role of liberation in that act, right? So we'll talk in the, I'll talk in the end about sort of the role of violence, but um, up until this point, it's uh, a continuation of the um, objective transformation of reality, which I'll discuss in a second. So with that being said, I'll begin uh, this discussion on Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppress. Alright, so um, one quick point. Again, if this is the first uh, segment that you're watching, I'll have these notes that I'm using available online. Um, just click the banner or click uh, the, the link in the description box and it'll take you to this PDF. You can download the PDF and you can supplement it with your own notes. All right. Um, so what we want to have a sense of, and we talked about this before a little bit, was the idea of false perception. C-E-P. False perception. Um, and the question is, well, what exactly is false perception and what's the function that uh, false perception plays in uh, Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed? Um, the first point is that um, this is not a denial of the facts, just a reinterpretation of the facts, right? What we'll see is that this act of attempting to reinterpret the facts um, is an attempt of rationalizing the facts. So if I have, if we're talking about perception, we have the perceiver, and we have the object. And yet we say that this object has a uh, factual validity, right? We say that this object has factual validity. The perceiver perceives the object. This object has some sense uh, of factual uh, validity. It can be weighed. It can be measured. There's a certain height to it. There's a certain dimension to it. It occupies a particular amount of space and so on. Um, what we're doing is that we're not denying in this act of false perception we're not denying the facts, right? It is not a denial of the facts. That's what the first thing says. It's not a denial of the facts. All that we're doing is that we are reinterpreting, right? A reinterpretation of the facts. Now, one of the easiest ways, and he doesn't discuss this, he being Freer doesn't discuss this at this point, but to show you how this reinterpretation of the facts is done, I'm going to uh, introduce a concept uh, that um, Freer refers to indirectly, but not explicitly. And the idea is one of valuation. Right? Valuation is um, basically a mechanism, a, a strategy, a method in which we can reinterpret the meaning of facts. Anytime we're talking about reinterpretation of, of perception, right, this false perception, the attempt to train my perception, when we're talking about the reinterpretation of perception, you can only have that discussion on the reinterpretation of perception within the context of the meaning of what it is that you're perceiving. So, just really quickly, imagine that we have two people. We have uh, Bob and we have Tim. Um, there are a number of facts that we can say about Bob and Tim. I can say that Bob is taller than Tim. Um, I can say that Tim is shorter than Bob. Right? These are both true claims. The claim that Bob is taller than Tim is true. The claim that Tim is shorter than Bob is true. No one's denying the facts, right? In this idea of false perception, it does not begin with a denial of the facts. What we do is we make a reinterpretation. We interpret the nature of these facts differently. Right? We add something to the facts that wasn't inherently in the fact. 
that process is a process of valuation. We're attributing some sense of value to a particular fact. So, for example, imagine that I live in a particular culture where people of taller stature, taller height, are, are deemed to be more handsome, more beautiful, more charming, more sincere, whatever, than people of a shorter stature. My apologies to sort of shorter stature people, right? But let's just imagine that fact. I would be able to make the claim that since my, my society values taller people than uh, um, shorter people, I might be able to make the claim that Bob is better than Uh, Tim, right? The claim that Bob is better than Tim is an evalu, an evalu, an evaluative. I can never say that word. An evaluative claim, right? We're making a, a value judgment. Bob is taller than Tim. Well, the question is why is Bob taller than Tim? The justification being Bob's, Bob's better than Tim because Bob is taller than Tim, right? Which shows the bias, right? My bias um, and the assumption being made is that the society justifies the claim that. Taller people are better than shorter people, for example. Very mundane example, but you get the point. The point being that um, the nature of the fact hasn't been denied, right? We are still claiming um, and making and justifying this claim that Bob is better than Tim based on the fact that Bob is taller than Tim. But what we've added in addition to this, right, is a, a mechanism in which we reinterpret the facts. We are reinterpreting the fact that Bob, Bob is taller than Tim to say that Bob, since he's taller than Tim, is better than Tim. So that's that's um, an initial example. Where's my eraser? Here we go. All right. So that's an evaluative, uh, sort of an evaluative claim, and we see the role that valuation plays in the reconstruction, the reinterpretation of factual information, um, which is very, very dangerous. And we'll see how this unfolds uh, in subsequent lectures. Um, this this. Uh, attempt at false perception is nothing more than another attempt to rationalize oppression, right? It's an attempt to rationalize the oppression of uh, other people. Obviously, in this case, it would be Bob's attempt to rationalize or justify, right? Rationalize or justify the oppression of Tim, right? If society recognizes the fact that Bob is taller than Tim, if society recognizes the fact that Tim is shorter than Bob, and society has a claim that taller people are better than shorter people, well, it's easy to make the correlation that Bob is better than Tim. Right? It's very, very simple to do that. Um, that, however, is problematic, right? And what we're doing in that act is we're attempting to rationalize the oppression of people like Tim. Pretty basic. Um, rationalized facts lose their objective basis, right? Rationalized facts lose their objective basis basis. And what does that mean? Okay. Well, the example, if you're following along, you know what the example is that I'm going to give. The example that I'm going to use is uh, the example of the Sambo, right? Hopefully you all know what a Sambo is. Right? The example of the Sambo. And it's usually um, the, the, the depiction of um, uh, a very, very dark African-American or even uh, a, white per a white man um, in, in blackface you know, protruding lips, very ignorant, sort of uh, very subservient, very willing to satisfy master's needs, right? This very sort of um, uh, demasculinized uh, conception of, or emasculated, uh, emasculated conception of uh, African-American men. Now, the argument is, if you were to engage in an argument with someone who is depersonalizing, dehumanizing, oppressing those people they sort of classify as Sambo, all of those Sambos. The question is, well, can't you see the facts, right? Remember, we're trying to make an appeal to the facts, right? Don't you see the fact that these people are people? They're human beings just like you. They're human beings just like you. They, they breathe just like you. They bleed just like you. Um, there wouldn't be a denial of that fact, right? The oppressor is not denying the fact that the Sambo is a man just like he is. I mean, some oppressors might, but it's not, it's, not, it's not important that that happened, right? You can acknowledge the humanity, well, not the humanity, but you can acknowledge the biological similarity, in a sense, of the oppressed group. So, sure, he's a human just like me. The question then becomes, how do we, how do we justify the continued uh, oppression of this group? 
We justify the continued oppression of, for example, the Sambo, or the class of Sambos, because we've rationalized the facts, right? Once we've rationalized these facts, once these facts lose their objective validity, the thing that we are basing our justification is on, then what people end up doing is they just, instead of referring to the fact that Bob is simply taller than um, Tim, they refer to the justification that our society has built to create this norm that taller is better than shorter, right? That white is better than black, right? So there is a fact that um, people have different shades of skin. Sure, the, your skin color is closer, is lighter. There really are no white and black people per se, but your, your skin color is lighter in nature. My skin color is darker in nature. That is a fact. Attributing value to uh, the skin color, saying that that skin color is better or worse than some other color, is um, justified in part based on the fact, but you can see how we're not talking about the facts anymore, right? What we've done is, and this is very, very important that you recognize this, what we've done is we've shifted the focus of the discussion from a discussion of the facts to a discussion on the justification of norms based on the facts, right? So now we talk about these, um, we talk about these norms as if the norms were f a fixed state of affairs, right? And this goes back to the uh, attempt, and I'll talk about it uh, briefly, the attempt at uh, destroying the, the um, objective transformation of reality. We want to objectively transform reality. And I said this in the last series of videos. And all that means is that we recognize at any given moment that reality is a consequence, right? A product of human ingenuity. Insofar as we recognize that reality is a product of human ingenuity, quote unquote, generally speaking, its reality is in a sense socially constructed. At least some forms, our, our cultural aspects and our social aspects of reality are socially constructed. Then we recognize that those aspects of reality which are socially constructed are completely within our nature to control, right? It is not like the gravitational constant, right? So uh, apartheid, it's two different facts, right? Apartheid is a fact. The gravitational constant is a fact. We don't have, and I don't know enough of physics to say if we have control, but I don't think we have control of the gravitational constant, but we definitely do have control over apartheid, right? Both facts, two different types of facts, one we have control over, and that's what he's talking about. That's what Fourier is talking about, is the objective, the OTR, right? The objective transformation of reality. Um, results from our recognition that we can transform the meaning that we've ascribed to the facts, right? Because here what you'll see is that we have the fact. If I can get my marker to work. Here we have the facts, right? But here is the meaning, right? Right? Here's the meaning of the facts. We've ascribed a certain meaning to this fact. And behind the statement that Bob is better than Tim um, is the meaning of the statement Bob is, Bob is better than Tim is that since, to really flesh it out, the argument would say, or the, the conclusion, the justification would say, since Bob is taller than Tim and since society A favors taller people, pe people than shorter people, then Bob is better than Tim. Right, so um, what we do is we attack, we attack the supposition that being taller is better, right? And you show very simple counterexample: a person who's in shorter stature but is of great moral standing, and so on. Okay, 